make it work. Uh, go and check the fencer, go and check the battery, go and check the insulator, go and check every step so it, it works. And this is what keeps a lot of people out of using electric fences because there's not enough people to, to do it. How much cheaper uh, is compared to barbed wire fence? Well, this is the, the estimate for a mile of uh, five thread barbed wire fence with posts every 16 feet. Materials and labor, $8,000. Compared to a mile of electric fence, one wire, one, one inch rebar every six feet, 60 feet, it's less than 10% of the price. The problem with this is that you need a fencer, a battery, a, a solar panel, all these together it is a thousand dollar, but you can use this thousand dollar for one mile or for 20 miles or for, so the more you divide the use of this thousand dollar, the cheapest every mile will be. But my point is, I just wanted you to have an idea how much cheaper it, it is. Uh, if we're talking about fencers, uh, uh, I have some recommendations. Go for the biggest. There's a lot of fencers in the market. And if you see the uh, specification, one Yule, half Yule, uh, that will not power a fence where you can hold, uh, I usually run 200, 300 cows. Uh, I fence uh, maybe four or five miles at a time. So I need a good fencer and I have tried several and there are less than 10 yules and they don't work. Uh, there are some devices that have a remote control, which is very hand handy. Uh, you find it not working, you go and, and where you find the fault, you can uh, put your remote control, turn everything off, fix everything and turn it on right there instead of going to turn it off, come back and fix it and then go back and turn it on. A solar panel, uh, four, 40 watts or more uh, with a con uh, energy controller. The battery, I recommend it to be a deep cycle, the one that they use for uh, boats. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any question any 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 time. This that's the objective of this. So something that I don't, I'm not very clear. Uh, let me know. Uh, the box where you keep your fencer, your solar panel, and your battery uh, is the base for the panel. The panel should be facing 45 degrees from the ground and facing south. That's the way to have more solar energy uh, going through it uh, during the day. If you face it somewhere else, uh, there will be times on the day that the, it will not be capturing uh, enough uh, solar energy. The ground rolls, uh, be, be sure that you are using actually actual uh, ground rolls. It can be nickel, can be copper, but do not use rebars as ground rolls because they rust and as they rust, they will not ground as they should. Uh, I you recommend to, to use porcelain insulators. Why? Because uh, a porcelain insulator either is, is working or is broken and you see it. But I have seen some uh, plastic insulators in, in, the, in the posts and they, they were wore out and you cannot see it from a distance, but uh, the wires are making contact between them in the center of the donut. So uh, it's hard to find it. But with porcelain, if it's working, it's okay. If it, it breaks, you see it from a distance. And then why tensile wire? Why high tensile? Because the soft wire will uh, bend on each insulator and make those uh, swing like shape and the high tensile uh, will never uh, bend on the insulator. It will be uh, flat most of the time. 
Uh, something that I have found out is that you don't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be very, very tight. The tighter you use it, the more strength you need on your edge braces and the easiest a porcelain breaks or uh, if, a, if a cow or wildlife goes through it, it's easier to break the higher the tension you have on it. Uh, what I usually do is just tighten it uh, with, with my own strength as much as I can and then use the, the uh, strainer uh, very little just to uh, tighten it a little more, but I leave a lot of slack in it, so it, it's, it's flexible and I don't have to use uh, so, so heavy edge braces. This Jorge, is the, you're, getting some, oh, you're getting some okay. questions too about the, uh, like uh, from Elise, she asked uh, woven, woven wire, um, which I imagine she means uh, poly wire um, and uh, kind of the differences between high tensile and poly wire. Okay. Uh, there's a big variety of products. Uh, I'm talking what I use to run a big herd of cows. But for example, for horses, uh, poly wire is very common because they horses are always looking where, uh, for a place to hurt themselves. And that poly wire, uh, poly is, is safer for them. Uh, the high tensile is the wire that I use. Then you have the soft wires, and then you have the poly wire uh, that I also use as a portable in a roll that I move once or twice a day. Uh, that's a, a different product. But for cows, for big herds of cows, this high tensile is what I use. Uh, as I told you, one of the advantages of the electric fences is the versatility. So this edge brace, if for some reason you decide to change the design of your paddocks, it's very easy to come and pull this edge this, this brace off and use it somewhere else. So the, I use these edge braces uh, because of the versatility. But check out how I use the the notches, the the these little pieces of the I don't know how to call them. Sorry for my English, but uh, I use them uh, to uh, uh, hold with each other, and then this wire ties them together. And this uh, here you can see my uh, ground rod re uh, ready to 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 be used. And then when, how I tie the porcelain, this, I always make a loop. I have seen many people uh, think that as long as your main wire goes around the, the, the donut is okay. But this full loop will keep it always in place. If you just run it once or twice, but don't do this, it can jump and make contact with this. Uh, when a cow or a deer or antelope hits the fence, this can jump and get out of place and, and start grounding. So I always make this loop and this, this twisted wire, the uh, reason is if for some reason this wire loses uh, tension, this twisted wire prevents the, the insulator to come and fall all the way on the metal and ground uh, lose all your energy. If this twisted wire holds the, the, the porcelain in place, even, even though there's no tension in the wire. Uh, if you have a, a dip in, in the, in the uh, soil, uh, I have seen some people running the fence, the electric wire, uh, according to the soil. Uh, to the level of the ground, but I rather keep my wire straight so I can pull it and give him give it the, the tension that I need and then come back and make a separate loop uh, to fill in that uh, that gap or that deep. 
if I pull strong this this wire, either because I I, I did it on purpose or a cow or a deer hit the fence, this rebar will be pulled out. In this way, uh, your wire is always where it should be, and this you can tighten it uh, separately. The same if you have a bump, well, you need to put, uh, even though you have your, your this, uh, standard distance, usually 60 feet uh, between rebars, well, sometimes you will have to put an extra rebar over there. Uh, and gates, uh, sometimes I have seen people running the same wire and they just uh, take it off and when you put it on the ground, you are grounding your whole uh, fence and you lose your energy. What I do is I have my fence insulated here and my other fence insulated here. And I have my, my gate insulated as well and, hold, and getting the energy from this side. When, when I unhook it from here, the gate is no longer charged. And if I drop it to the ground, it doesn't ground the whole fence. Then on the, on the ground, I uh, bury a piece of hose and through that hose, I put a wire to run the electricity from this to this other uh, side of the fence. Well, that's what I have about the fencing itself. What to be careful on, on your fences, but now how you plan where to build your electric fences. Well, I usually start with a map of the ranch where this is an example. And this is just the, these are, these are two ranches together. That's why is the middle division, but this is just the perimeter of the ranch. And then when you have it, you draw in it, that stuff that you cannot move for, for any reason. Uh, bluffs, rock walls, public roads, you, you cannot put fences on public roads, railroad power lines, water bodies, water flows. Uh, if you want to, if there are a great difference, you can also draw in your map, your different grasslands. Usually I don't because the idea is that uh, as Reed was saying, one of the purposes is keeping uh, diversity. So uh, you don't have to be very accurate or very uh, met with the, your different grasslands. Okay, for example, this ranch, I have the perimeter and then I have this bluff that works like a natural fence. And then I have those roads that I cannot put a fence on them. So I have to respect these public roads. So now the ranch starts shaping some uh, grassing areas, separate grassing areas. Then you have your map, the, you draw the, the stuff that you cannot move. Then you draw your, your own infrastructure, you, the, the, what you have, uh, your private, private roads, your actual fences, wells, pipelines, storage, drinkers, uh, headquarters, pens and barns. For example, in this ranch, uh, this has almost no, no barbed wire fences, just this division, but this one has these uh, barbed wire fences. Uh, headquarters are right here. So again, every every step you will, uh, the, the map itself starts showing your grassing areas. Then you put your drinkers in your pipelines, and this is what you, got, what you have. Uh, why I say this process? Because uh, I have seen a lot of ranches planned only, okay, let's build a fence right here. You go to the con open country and let's build a fence right here. You don't know what size are the two paddles that you are building. You don't know a lot of information that you can see in a map and you can make the same effort to build that, that mile of fence over there with no planning. When you put it on a, on a map and you uh, obey your guidelines, okay, I want two pastors the same size or whatever, 
it, it's a lot it, way easier to make it uh, several plans on paper than going and building a, a piece of fence and then figure out that it was in the wrong place. So you have all your drinkers. What I usually do, do is from, from the drinkers, I draw a circle around them. Uh, for example, half a, half a mile, if you are in a rocky, steep country, um, maybe a mile and a half when you are in soft level country and, and, any, and anything in between. And it all depends on your experience and the kind of cattle that you're running. For example, uh, Bosmara cattle, they can walk eight miles a day and they don't care. And some uh, beef cattle that is very common in, in, in United States, either they come from the, the uh, continental breeze or uh, is islands uh, breeze, they don't walk that much. So depending on your experience, you, you, you want to decide how much you want your cattle to, to walk. When you do so, okay, for example, I got this drinker and I draw a circle around it. Now, the, the map itself told me that this looked like a grassing cell. And now I, I realize that it has its own natural border. It has the main drinker, but you also have secondary drinkers available. But, but uh, and it leaves this area out. Okay, you can do the same. Build, uh, draw this circle in this uh, drinker, and you will have the design will, will start showing up. When you have your your drinkers to separate, the circles will not match. So in that case, you have two options: either you build a, a new drinker in between. Or that's a good place for one of your electric fences to divide two different grassing, grassing cells, one going to one drinker and one going to the, the other drinker. So yeah, you start uh, identifying your grassing cells, you measure it. For example, with Google, Google Earth is awesome to do it. You just draw your, your grassing cell and it tells you how many acres. After that, you say, okay, I want two pastures, 10 pastures, 20 pastures. Well, you just divide them this area and, and make them as even as possible. How many paddles you want, design each paddock products as even as possible. Suggestion, use the secondary drinkers to feed two pastures. So I started with my grassing cell with my main drinker and the, the first line that I make is from this drinker to this one. And from this drinker to this, from this drinker to this, from this drinker to this. And then, so I have my secondary drinkers feeding two pastures each. After the drinker, I decide where this pasture, this line goes to make this pasture almost the same size than this and this and this and this. And I did the same with this uh, grass in sale and the same with this. This way you, you're, you are designing your pastures uh, very even and you can use them very even as well. This is one design. Uh, okay, design your center pens with the number of gates and then use the gate as mm, gate posts as H braces for your electric fences. This is another ranch. This is my, my gathering pen. And every corner has two gates. So uh, from this corner, it comes this, this fence, but this gate opens for this and for this. In between fences, in between corners, there's a, a, another fence, but every corner has two gates. And then they come to this, Pen and these are my, my it, it, here where I'm designing my, my working pens. So the cattle has to work to, to get into the working pens to drink water. It's, uh, I, I, I go and brand in different ranches and cattle get into the pens once a year, only when they're gonna be branded or whatever. Uh, I like to make my cattle 
go and get into the drinker, into the working pens every day. They feel it at home. And when you need to brand, you just call them, they come by themselves and, and, and you work them with no stress. And then you can be creative uh, according to the grassing system that you are gonna use. For example, this is for uh, holistic or rotational grassing system. This is the pasture that I had designed. This is another pasture of the same ranch where we are doing the ultra intensive grassing system. We have these strips and, and then we, we move the cattle once or uh, twice a day through these lanes and we harvest the good, the regular, and the bad stuff all together. But for example, you, you find that this pasture has no water and this pasture has no water. So because I know where my pipeline is, I can dig, uh, bury, uh, dig out my, my pipeline, make a takeoff from there and use a, a portable drinker. And that's what we, we, we use a portable drinker here. We use a portable drinker here. A, a portable, uh, every drinker can feed this lane and the two lanes next to it. Because you, you open the door and make a loop with a portable fence and this, this cattle can come and drink uh, from here and go to, to this lane. So one drinker helps for three lanes. So I need uh, one more here and one more here and that will be it. With two takeoffs in the same pipeline, the water problem is solved with a portable drinker. So uh, that's what I have about how to build a fence and how to plan on it. If there's any question, uh, I will appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jorge, for that presentation. I loved the map um, and showing exactly where your paddocks are and how they can be different shapes. And it's all based on like, yeah, your drinkers in the land. So I thought that was really mm. amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now we can move into the, the Q and A portion. And so um, I, I have some questions in here that I got in the chat that I wanna share with Jorge. And also um, if you have a question that you wanna ask aloud, that's more than welcome. I'm gonna go through the chat first and we can start from there. Um, and so one question I have um, that was the most recent is, oh, oh, I see from Rebecca, what kind of portable drinker do you use? Uh, I built, I bought a propane tank, uh, 10,000 gallons propane tank, cut in half and made a base based on it. The, pro, uh, the main issue with the portable drinker is not the size, but the pressure you have, uh, the, the, the water, uh, for example, this portable drinker is more than enough for 300 cows because in that pasture we have a lot of pressure. The water is coming from a storage tank that is uh, elevated. So it comes with a lot of pressure and the cows cannot drink all the water before it refills itself. So the main issue with a portable drinker more than the size of the drinker is the, the pressure you have in the pipeline. But for, for example, I use a metal, uh, it's, it's a propane tank. And I have seen some ranches that on purpose, they run high pressure pipelines. And a drinker the size of uh, 50 gallons is more than enough for 100, 150 cows, and depending on the pressure. Thank you, Jorge. And another question, um, that has to do with a little bit earlier on with the fencing is that someone was asking, uh, what do you do when the ground rod is too dry? Do you have to add water for a good ground? Mm, I haven't had that problem and I, I'm in New Mexico and it's dry here. Uh, I have never uh, had to put water. Uh, as long as you have those uh, ground rebars, they are, six or seven or maybe eight feet long and you run those six seven feet all the way into the ground and they they work good so uh, if your fence is not hot and you get to the conclusion 
that the ground is not working, well then, then I will suggest to, well, make, make a try with water. But 90% of the cases, the defense is not working. The problem is not the ground. The problem is either the battery, either the defensor or a short put somewhere that is taking all the, the, the energy off. Um, great. And then another question was, when do you decide the size of your brakes and how often do you adjust? And do you allow the cattle to, to back graze during the growing season? Uh, can, can you repeat the question? What, the, the, the size of the what? Yeah, absolutely. How do you decide the size of your brakes and how often do you adjust? What do you mean? The, I don't understand what brakes. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe they mean the paddocks is what okay. I would do. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, if it's about the ultra intensive grazing, how much uh, land I give them every day, that's the part of the art of grazing. You have to learn how to read your cows, uh, your cows' bellies, your cows, uh, they're talking to you. Uh, when you get there and they are moving to you and they are uh, not full, you you found out, find out that you gave them too, too short. So next next movement, movement, you give them a little, too, a little more. Uh, you can be as, as technique as you want. You can go and measure, well, one square foot is providing such and such amount of grass, and I have X, X amount of cows that I want to feed. You can go all through that technique, or you can just uh, educate your, your eye and, and do it uh, on, on, the, on daily basis. Uh, yeah, the size is according to what they say. And yeah, when the idea is to use one, one of those strips, you use it in one week. So even if it's full summer with a lot of moisture, in one week, let's say your cows have access to big grown green grass because it's summer and, and rainy. They don't care about the, the regrowth in the first eight days. If, you're, if your strip is too long and they are coming back to the drinker more than 10 days, uh, maybe they will re-eat the growing grass and you don't want that. But if, if your strip is planted to be used in a week, in a week they won't do any, any problem. Great, thank you so much, Jorge. There's good questions coming into the chat, you guys. Thank you for dropping it in. Um, and so kind of related to that and the paddock size and really getting to know your cows, like getting to know your livestock, a question that I have that someone asked is, are your cows trained easily to move to the next paddock or do you need to herd them through the gate into the next paddock? And how long does it take before your cows are trained to move? It's incredible how fast they learn. I have settled these grassing systems in different ranches where cows didn't know electric fences and they didn't know what they were for. And within two days, they will figure it out. Uh, I put my own cows in the electric fence for the first time. Uh, they all got a chalk and they respected it. Next, next day I came and moved it and they went running through it, but they found the, the other one holding them. So they, they they stood up and stopped there and start, started eating. In one day or two, two movements or three movements, they figure it out. And now they just see me and they just start walking behind me. As I'm rolling my electric fence, they are walking behind me and they move themselves. But, and, and, and in the rotational system where we move, the cattle for every three, five, or seven days is very common that you, you start yelling at the pen, at the drinker, yelling or whistling, or some people use a bell or a ring, 
and they come by themselves because they know they are called to, to get into a new pastor. In three or four changes, they, they learn it. That's amazing. And maybe even sometimes they're excited, right? Excited to get some new grass. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's keep them going. There's so many. All right. Um, so I'm just trying to keep them all in line. Uh, so someone, and I think this might be a question that other people have is in terms of the timing um, on moving your cows, mm -hmm. what do you look for in the grass that tells you it's time to move the cows? Okay. Uh, well, you don't move the cows depending, you make your plans of moving them. Okay, let's move in, let's move them once a day or two times a day or three times a day. Uh, the most successful ranches move their cattle five times a day. In order to do that, they have a, uh, a mo mobile home going next to the cows and a guy lives there and that's all his work. Somebody else is responsible for water. Somebody else is responsible for everything else, but his, his duty is just move the cows five times a day. Why? The matter is that you are making your cattle eat the good grasses, the regular grasses and the bad grasses all together. So if you move them once a day, a third of the day they are eating very good stuff, a third of the day they are going, eating the regular stuff and a third of the day they are eating the bad stuff. If you put your cattle for three months in a pasture, that's exactly the same. One month eating the good stuff, two months, uh, the second month eating the regular stuff and the third month eating the bad stuff. In that month eating the bad stuff, they lose condition. And, and finally you say, you know, let's, let's quit. You move them somewhere else before they lose more condition. So the problem is, not the problem. What you pay attention is how, how much time you make them hungry enough to eat the bad stuff. And you don't want that uh, hungry time to be too long because any one of us can resist two hours with no eating but not 10 hours or not 24 hours or not 36 hours uh, so that's what you want you you, you want to have your cows going to as hungry enough to eat that that bad stuff but 10 minutes later you get your good stuff so you go to the pasture and you see if they are still eating, it means there are still some. But sometimes you get to the pasture and they are all already on the uh, on the top of the fence looking at you, not not taking not interested at all in in looking for something because so they have been hungry too long. What you want is when you get there, some of your uh, some cows will come looking uh, to you, some cows will still be eating uh, in the back. And they, uh, so that, that's the harmony that you are looking for. All right, thank you so much, Jorge. Um, let's see. So I think what, what I wanna do is um, try to find like questions that are really specific to Jorge. And then what I'd like to do after that, I think there's like a couple more, is open it up the floor too. If, if someone wants to add to any, anything that Jorge has said or um, wants to uh, maybe clarify a question that they had in the chat, um, this is a great time. So this is like a place for everyone to share out what they know because everyone knows a little bit, right? And, mm -hmm. and so this is a great time to, to do that. So I'm gonna ask one more question that's really specific to Jorge is, uh, Jorge, do you have a favorite fencing supplier? Uh, not the supplier, but uh, I like the speed right fencer. The speed right comes with a control, a remote control, uh, especially the 600. Uh, and that's the one that I like the most. Uh, there are some trademarks, very common, but I don't want to talk bad about them. So uh, I, I won't make any bad comment about any trademark, but this one, the speed right, it works very, very good and I like it a lot. Perfect. And, and I get it 
in a store online that is uh, Premier One Supply. That's, that's the name of the, the store. All right, Premier One Supply. You guys are interested? Um, okay, and so now there's still more questions in the chat. So I'm going to open the floor. Thank you, Jorge, for sharing your wealth of knowledge. And you're also, these questions are open to you too. Um, more than welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's like you have such a wealth of knowledge and it's been such a joy. Um, and so now what I'd like to do is maybe take a pause and see, does anyone um, want to ask their question aloud if we haven't gotten to it in the chat or have uh, suggestions or, or comments on some of the things we've talked about already? Um, this is a good time. You're welcome to uh, raise your hand or unmute your mic. I know most people have their cameras off. If you guys know the Zoom reactions, you can raise your hand as a Zoom reaction, but you don't have to do that. Um, so yeah. All right, Talia, I see your hand is up. Um, I'd like to know what's involved in moving the fences and how you pound. I, I heard you say, I think you said every 60 feet between rebars, that seems very, a very far distance, but so what is the distance between your, your fence posts and how do you pound and how do you remove them? And also you said six feet for your grounding rod. Does that mean you sink five feet of that in the ground? And if so, how do you do that? Yes, uh, I use for, for my fence, I use uh, half inch rebars every 60 feet the, uh, where I have, uh, let's say, uh, leveled ground. Uh, that's, that's enough. Uh, I walk 20 steps and put my, my rebar and in insulator, 20 step, 20 step, 20 step. For my portable, I also use 20 step Instead of wire, I use the poly wire that I'm, that I'm rolling. And for the ground, yeah, I stick uh, five feet or uh, into the ground and leave, in fact, maybe five, five and a half. I just, you just need six inches on top to put your clamps and put your wire in the clamps and you're grounded. Uh, thank you, Jorge, but what tools, uh, my experiences with pounding the rebar um, and pounding anything into the ground where I live is like almost pounding into cement. How do, you, how do you get those rebar and how do you get five feet of a grounding rod in the ground and then how do you remove it? Uh, okay, well, no, no, the, the, ground, uh, the ground rod will be there and use you better think that you will leave it there forever. And uh, yeah, I have had that trouble that you hit rock and you just stick uh, two or three feet. Uh, so what I do is put two or three re different rebars, uh, different bars. Uh, if I can just dig them and bury them one feet or two feet, uh, I put several and tie them all with, with a wire. And that way you have at least six feet of, of ground bar touching the ground. It doesn't have to be one single bar. It can be several bars, one foot or two foot each. And yeah, you need to understand that you will leave them there. So you need to find the good place for your fencer where your fencer can uh, send the, the electricity to different fences in different pastures. All right, great. Um, and then I'm gonna go back to the chat because I know there are some questions there that we didn't get to. Um, and so one question that's kind of related to this is uh, what about self-insulating posts instead of steel rebar? Um, I realize they're more expensive, but they eliminate the need for insulators and the possibility of shorting out. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, they are more expensive. They are handier, uh, so usually they are more fragile, so they, they break easier. 
if if a cow or deer or antelope runs through them, uh, the rebar you can you can bend it back and and that's it. Uh, and those they are I say they are fragile because they either have a hole where you put the the wire through, or they must have a notch where you tie the 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 wire, and that weakens the material. And the rebar is the solid rebar and the insulator attached to it. You don't weaken the, 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 the rebar. But yeah, they're, they're good. And, and the other problem is you cannot hammer them into the ground. If you have hard soil, uh, it's not so easy to hammer them into the ground as the rebar. All right, and then another question from Ben is, uh, and I think you touched on this a little bit, but um, so his situation is that they have to use the poly wire um, and portable fencing exclusively. Um, so do you have any suggestions for operations that are entirely dependent on poly wire or like the non-permanent infrastructure? No. No, no, nothing special. You go ahead with your design, go ahead with your building, and and nothing comes to my mind as a special warning or advice. Mm -hmm. Is there? Gracias, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Gracias, Jorge. Excuse me. Thank you so much. Oh, more than welcome. All right, is anyone here using Polywire who would like to share maybe their experiences with using it um, for Ben's situation? So I can, I've used it a little bit. Um, I use it, I, I graze cows here for about a month in the summer. We have irrigated pasture. And I use it to contain a herd of about 28 pair and we move them, um, having not had the benefit of Jorge's wisdom, we move them kind of every three or four days. And uh, depending on the, my goal is to improve the pasture and get them to eat the thistles, which they don't like to eat. So it works pretty well. We use one wire, we use uh, mostly plastic posts because we don't have a very long run. Um, and a pretty small charger. I mean, it's it's not like it's not a big, it's not a it's a very small operation. Thank you for sharing, Elise. Yep. For folks who who are doing it um, with with fiberglass posts, um, pounding those um, kind of thin fiberglass posts in the ground, I recommend um, if you can find a bullet casing um, to put on top of those those. Uh, narrow fiberglass posts um, and and that way when you're pounding them in with a hammer or fencing pliers um, you're not chipping away at the fiberglass because um, that stuff sucks when it gets into your hands um, and so if you can uh, yeah put a put a bullet casing over it as you as you pound them into the ground if you're not using rebar and you're in soft enough soil uh, that works pretty darn well. Yeah, and Kincove and the companies that sell those fiberglass posts, they have little plastic caps that actually fit on the top of the post perfectly, whether it's quarter inch or uh, three fourth inch, whatever it happens to be. And so there's a tool, if you lose that, the bullet is your next best um, resource there. All right, thank you guys for sharing that. And then I realize there's one more question and this I feel like can be a whole conversation. So, um, but about determining stock density, um, how do you determine stock density? And maybe Jorge, if you wanna share like your process for determining that, I think that would be great. Well, the stock density will determine the animal impact that you make on the ground. I run a ranch and they're in Mexico for 15 years doing the rotational grassing system, uh, moving the cows every five to seven days during the growing season or 10 to 15 days during the non-growing season. 
And I made a, a, a lot of progress in covering the bare ground. But when I found the benefits of the ultra intensive brassing system, uh, I realized that what I did in four years, uh, you can make it in one if you get enough rain. Uh, you can make it in one with ultra intensive. So uh, I heard the first time from the ultra intensive system from a ranch in Chihuahua where they used to run uh, the, the normal capacity of the ranch for years was 800 cows. Five years after doing the ultra intensive grassing system, they went to 1600. Five years more, they were in 3200. And five, five more years, I mean, 15 years later, they are running 4,000 cows in the ranch that used to run 800. And they have herds of uh, something between 500 and 900 cows in a herd. And they put 500 cows in, let's say, four acres for three hours. So that's a lot of animal impact. They eat everything but they trample everything and they incorporate the organic matter. So it's, it's amazing the, the work they do. If you get, I, I, I have been doing that here for the last four years, but I haven't got rain to, to make it show. So I'm still, every year, my grass has grown an inch uh, with the very few rain that we have got. I'm still waiting for a regular rainy year to make all that work show. But yeah, the, the, the stocking density will determine the, the animal impact. And that's, that's what you have to, to, to have in mind. And, and that's what you have to train your eye to see if the cows are doing what you expected them to do or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jorge. Yeah, there's like a, a beauty, beauty in like really watching and observing and, and seeing what's going on and, and using that to inform your decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, I love, I love that you share that. And I know we're, we're just a couple minutes over time and I know there's a couple more questions, but the conversation doesn't stop here. Uh, so I'm just gonna share uh, contact information and um, this is kind of like our additional resources if you wanna follow up with Jorge specifically about some of the things he talked about. Um, and then let me just share my screen. There we go. Yeah, and I guess I guess everybody can have my email. If, if, if you wanna email me, there you, you have it there. And I, yep. I will be more than happy to answer some questions. So yeah, uh, so these are, this is uh, Reed's email and Clark's email. Um, they have a lot of experience with this. And so you're also welcome to write down these emails. And with that, I don't know, Reed, if you want to close us out, um, if there are any last, last things you wanted to say. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks, Jorge. And uh, again, sorry about the connectivity issues here. Um, but yeah, uh, this is just the start of the conversation. So, uh, so please reach out to us. Um, if you're if you're working through kind of your your electric fence system and your rotational grazing, uh, reach out and we're happy to help and, and connect you to resources in your area, um, and and get folks kind of out on the land and 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 managing our animals. So uh, thanks so much, and and we'll have some more of, of these sort of workshops uh, through this year, and and so we hope you guys can join us. Um, but yeah, have a lovely Tuesday, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Jorge. Yeah, thank you so much, Jorge. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. Looking forward to see you again. <laughs>